the Open EdX Podcast. This is John Mark Walker, your host. Today's guests are Ken Haas and Walter Bender from Sorcero, a startup adding uh, artificial intelligence to online learning. Uh, they're going to tell you all about that. Walter Bender will be the keynoter of the uh, Open edX conference coming up uh, March 26th to 29th at the University of California, San Diego. I'm Ken Haas. Um, I uh, have a background in artificial intelligence, which I worked in since uh, before it was cool. Uh, and uh, when was that? <laughs> when was it ever cool? Yeah. <laughs> I have to say, it, it is kind of cool now, but I started uh, working with neural nets when I was in high school, and then I came to MIT and got uh, three degrees there, uh, ending up with a thesis in the artificial intelligence lab. Uh, my thesis was about understanding computer creativity and uh, how to uh, help computers be creative and come up with new ways of looking at the world. And then I went to be a professor at the Media Lab, also at MIT. Uh, when I went there, uh, some people accused me of doing the same old thing by just staying at MIT. But in fact, uh, the Media Lab was more different than any computer science department anywhere else that I would have gone to that it was actually a, a big change and a cool change because my colleagues were uh, artists and composers and designers and psychologists and educators. And so I began thinking a lot more about sort of the human dimension and using AI not so much as a, something that would supplant people, but that would improve people or amplify people. And um, did a lot of work on that. Um, did some work in Europe, trying to get some labs started up there. Uh, had my own company being Meta, which was commercializing the work I did when I was a professor at the Media Lab. Um, and joined Socero about uh, eight months ago now. And uh, the thing that really excites me about it is that it is in the education space and it's about using AI um, to help change people's minds in a good way. And have them think differently about problems they're dealing with. And one of the ways to do that is by being able to actually answer their questions uh, and making the whole online learning experience uh, more interactive and personalized uh, by using understanding of who people are and what they're trying to learn. Excellent. And, and what is your role exactly at Sorcero? I'm the chief AI officer. Chief AI officer. Okay. I think that's a title that's going to be in vogue, uh, if not already. Um, yeah, it's part of it's part of the being cool thing. <laughs> we we all strive to be. Uh, great. Thank you, uh, Walter. Uh, tell us about yourself. Okay. Um, my name is Walter Bender. I'm uh, chief learning officer at Sorcero. I've never had that title before. It's kind of exciting. Um, and my background, I. Um, uh, I actually discovered uh, MIT back in the uh, the mid 1970s because uh, Nicholas Negroponte, uh, who was running a, a little research group at the time, had a, a color Xerox machine without a key operator, and that meant that I could use the color Xerox machine for free. So I used to <laughs> I was doing a lot of uh, graphic design at the time and having free access to a Xerox machine. I mean. Having free access to a Xerox machine at all was kind of great. Yeah. Color machine, that was awesome. Yeah, amazing. And I, I just, uh, I realized that there was a lot of cool stuff going on. So I pretty much ended up coming to MIT and um, not leaving for quite some time. So I, I worked with, uh, with Ken at the Media Lab for many years and with Ken's mentor, Marvin Minsky. Okay. Uh, I was more involved with uh, an area called electronic publishing uh, at the time. And it was really about understanding texts and trying to figure out how to uh, utilize that understanding to make information be um, uh, more useful to people. Um, but it's interesting what, what happened. I, I actually have this thesis that there's no such thing as an interdisciplinary professor but uh, there are interdisciplinary students. And the reason why there's interdisciplinary students is because this students 
you know, significant others in that other professor's research group. So the students go back and forth exchanging ideas. And it happened that uh, some of my students were hanging out with some of Seymour Papert's students. And because of that, I started thinking about publishing not just as a way of transferring knowledge and information from one place to another, but actually as an opportunity for learning. And in particular, the, the approach to learning that Seymour students were espousing was this idea of um, constructionism. But I, I sum it up um, quite simply. It's if you want more learning, you want more doing. And so it was very much a, a hands-on um, doing approach to learning. And I started to apply that to publishing. So the, the, the student, the sort of the subject of, of, of the knowledge transfer would acquire that knowledge by actually um, being an active participant as opposed to just being a passive consumer. There was actually, there was an interesting program at IBM in the 70s and early 80s called Writing to Read. And the idea was to um, learn to read by writing. Interesting. And, um, in, in some sense, uh, we, we, we took that same idea and applied it to a lot of aspects of, of publishing. So uh, we were sort of early... Um, we, we built uh, early versions of things like uh, the, the petite people today call blogging, for example. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, getting, getting the user to be a more active participant in, in all aspects of, of publishing, writing, editing, um, critiquing, etc. cetera. So um, all that said, um, I, I got to the point where I needed a, a little bit of a break from MIT. I'd been there for close to 30 years and, uh, MIT, uh, well, I can say this even though we're on, on record. <laughs> you know, MIT, like any large organization, is a large organization. And large organizations are bureaucratic, and sometimes, you know, the bureaucracy sort of gets in the way of what you want to do. So um, I, I left MIT in 2006 um, with Nicholas Negroponte, and we started something called One Laptop Per Child. Sure. There the idea was really to take a lot of these these learning concepts that have been coming out of Seymour uh, uh, and uh, Papert and Marvin Minsky's research for close to 40 years and take them to scale. So it was really, how can we take these ideas? We know these are, are, are powerful ideas around learning. How can we actually reach kids? So we decided the, the, the part of the bottleneck was just that kids don't have access to computers. Why don't they have access to computers? Well, computers are expensive and computers are, are, are fragile. And so we built a, a robust, inexpensive laptop. We, we called it the $100 laptop, although it never quite got to that price point. Right. And, um, we developed a learning platform on top of it called Sugar, and I've been working on it pretty much ever since. Um, and, it, I mean, the cool thing about it, one of the things that we decided right from the very beginning was that everything was going to be transparent. Everything was going to be open. Um, we, were, we built the whole platform using um, free software, Software Libre. Yeah. And uh, very deliberately, um, both because we didn't want to have any black boxes, but also because, um, and again, I probably shouldn't say this on record, but you know, we wanted the kids to take ownership and responsibility and have the ability to take ownership and responsibility. Right. Um, you know, so, the, you know, but it wasn't child labor, but it was, uh, <laughs> that's good. good but, but, but the kids, you know, so for example, we, you know, the, the laptops we deployed in rural Nepal in 2007 are still running today. Oh, okay. And the reason why they're still running today is not because we built an indestructible laptop. Yeah. We built a laptop that kids could fix. Okay. So when it breaks, the kids fix it. And the same with the software. And so actually one of the things that I'm most proud of with the Sugar software, and I remember um, I was at a, 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 I think it was in 2008, um, I was giving a talk at, um, the, um, at, at this conference, there's an annual conference at, at in, um, Cambridge every year for the, run by the uh, Free Software Foundation called Libre Planet. And um, I gave a talk sort of laying out the goal that the, the, the students the kids using the laptop because they were using free open source software would eventually get to the point where they were not just consumers, but they were also contributors. And so John Gilmore uh, at the time said, well, how many 
patches have you gotten from the kids? And I said, well, you know, give me some time, John. At that time, zero patches from kids. But by, um, uh, you know, an, an, another four or five years later, 50% of the patches were from kids. Interesting. Uh, and so, you know, I, but what we did, you know, there's sort of this, this East Coast, West Coast thing. And, and right. in terms of terminology, and I'm going to exaggerate things a little bit, but the West Coast being a little bit more pragmatic, they talk about open source. And uh, that's not so scary to business. Right, right. And, uh, but open, you know, means you can see how it works. Right. Um, software Libre is about having a license to actually do something about it. Right. So the sort of East Coast terminology is about not just being able to look, but also be able to do. And what we did with Sugar is we took it a step further and we said, okay, not only do you have a license, but we're going to give you some scaffolding so you can exercise that license. So we're going to actually enable you to do things. Interesting. Well, I mean, I, I have to interject that the Free Software Foundation started in Boston, not, you know, not San Francisco. I think there's a reason for that. Yeah. Well, yeah. But anyway, the, um, but, but um, in any case, uh, you know, the, the, the idea that uh, these ideas are powerful in learning and the kids right. give them the right opportunities, they'll exploit these ideas and, and really do wonderful things. And I've seen it over and over and over again. And um, the other thing is that, you know, there's a little bit of uh, Tom Sawyer in me. I'm, yeah. I'm a lazy boy. And if you, you know, try to build everything yourself, that's a lot of work. That's but right. A little platform that other people can contribute to. They can, you know, not only do they, uh, you know, whitewash uh, Aunt Polly's fence for you, but uh, they, um, you know, actually come up with their own cool ideas on top of that. And, things that I would never have thought of. And so right. that's part of the, the pleasure. Sort of like when you get a great student, a great student's not a student who comes in and does what you want them to do. It's a great student is somebody who comes in and takes you to the next place. Right, exactly. Uh, so that's all part of the, the ethos of, of uh, uh, Software Libra. Now, let me sort of try to make the connection to Socero, which is- Thank the, you, I was just about to go there. <laughs> <laughs> you can edit this, you know, so <laughs> I'm a student, but. Uh, slice and dice a little bit. Oh, okay. uh, I'll, try, I'll try to put more pregnant pauses to make it easier. <laughs> no worries. Go for it. <laughs> but um, so I mean, I, I've been um, following Ken's work and uh, we've collaborated on, on a lot of different things over the years, um, particularly around the, the news projects that we were working on in the, uh, in the 90s uh, and early 2000s. Um, Ken told me what they were trying to do at Socero, which is really trying to take um, AI and knowledge about how people think and apply that to the problem of, of, of learning, and in particular to the kinds of problems that I think the open edX world is trying to solve. Which right. is, um, you know, there really is a need to help people um, it, um, learn new skills because the bottom line is the only thing that uh, is constant is change. Right. And uh, so there's always going to be a need to be learning new things, learning new skills, learning to learn. And uh, that's, uh, uh, it, it, it's not, let me, let me rephrase this. Um, there's nothing better than having a great mentor. A great what? I'm sorry. Mentor. Ah, yes. A great mentor. So Ken and I both had the pleasure of working, for example, with Marvin Minsky. And what okay. Marvin had a knack for doing was getting the people around him to think and, and you know, engage and really, um, you know, it was, it was, some of it was Socratic. A lot of it was just fun, just pure fun, but just the joy of, of thinking about ideas and tearing them apart and putting them back together again. And, uh, but the problem is that, um, you know, we lost Marvin a few years ago, and uh, there, even when we had Marvin, he didn't scale very well. No. You know, I know that, you know, there's a lot of work around cloning, and we've got... <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that goes way beyond the scope of this podcast. But, <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, um, you know, the question is, um, you know, if we can't provide everyone with, with a Marvin Minsky, what can we provide them with? And so well, um, the answer to that would be we make more Marvin Minsky's, right? I mean, the, the teacher, the learner becomes the teacher, the mentee becomes the mentor. 
Like, yeah, so certainly you guys part would be of the case in point, you know. Part of it is, is turning the model on its head a little bit. Um, but I think part of it also is that um, you know, it, it, it takes a lot of, of, of skill, a lot of experience to do that well. Sure. Okay. I'm going to start off as a Marvin. Um, I can say, okay, you're now the, 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 the mentor, but it, it, it doesn't just happen that way. And actually, right. one of the things that I observed um, when we were doing One Laptop Per Child um, again, because it was a free software project and all the developers were dispersed around the world, right. um, we, we did what most free software projects do, is we communicate through very um, you know, austere channels like IRC. And sure. we're talking about things. Austere, yes. we're talking about things. But what we did with the laptop is we put an IRC pro program on the laptop. Yeah. So the kids come and join our channel. And what the kids were doing when they join our channel is they're watching these domain experts argue and, right. discuss and debate and try to solve problems. So at first the kids are just there and they're observing, but because they're kids, they're behaving like kids as well. And they're, you know, making jokes and interrupting and they're disturbing. And, but if you, after a while, they actually start to catch on. Right. And start to make some contributions. And then after a while, they're the ones that are, doing everything, yeah. and then for a while, they're the ones that are the mentors for the next batch of kids. And it so, time to get there, but yeah. Yeah, you know, and it, it does take time to get there. And I think part of the goal behind the, the, the project that Ken and I are doing at Cicero is can we use AI to sort of accelerate, enhance um, that process? So right. can, we, can we take um, content um, understand it using the AI and much more the way people understand things. Right. Um, also, you know, to the extent we can, and this is now the, the hand waving part of the talk, um, but the extent that we can understand also how someone might teach those content to someone else. In other words, um, what, what's the best way for me to um, explain this to you? Uh, well, in order to do that, I need to understand you and, and how you learn and how you think and how you think about the world and what your context is. I need to understand the content and I need to understand different modalities of pedagogy. And right. to which we can begin to have the AI help in that process, not replace the mentor, but make that mentor much more um, uh, able to scale. Yeah, That's really what we're after. It's not gonna be virtual Minsky, it's gonna be. Yeah, yeah. Um, in Marvin in a box. <laughs> What's that? Marvin in a box. Just <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah I, I'm sure that would be great marketing, but I'm not sure you could be able to live up to that title. Yeah, yeah. I think that uh, part of it is that um, you never got the same lesson from Marvin twice. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, it was. Uh, he resisted duplication. Yeah. Well, I'm mean, actually, so, you know, one of Marvin's uh, Polar tricks, um, so just to, to, to sort of demonstrate how old Ken and I are, <laughs> you know, well, Marvin, we used to go to lectures when Marvin used overhead projectors, okay? And I'm sure that most of the audience for this talk has no idea what an overhead projector is. Yeah, I, I can still vaguely remember <laughs> <laughs> the old elements. I, I can but um, I mean, actually, you know, the, the ed tech I had when I was in, in elementary school was um, what were those things called? Um, the, the the little view graph thing. It was like a it was like a a roll. It was like a oh right a, a view master. Not a view master. I'll think of it in a second. But, uh, uh, and, and then the other thing we had, we had mimeograph machines. And the great thing was to be able to be the one that to go and do the mimeograph machine because you got got to get high on the ink. <laughs> Please don't make a content warning on this podcast. We used to call it the purple plague. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's all, you know, lazy teacher would just crank out worksheets. And, and right. yeah. but, um, but what Marvin used to do with, his, with overhead projector, you have a bunch of transparencies and you put them on the overhead projector one at a time and you give your talk. Right. But the nice thing about, um, about overheads as opposed to, say, PowerPoint. Yeah you have complete random access. So right. Marvin would walk up to the podium with his overheads and oops, just somehow or other they'd fall on the floor. 
we just scatter. And um, so he would walk over and he'd look down, oh, well, let's talk about this. And he'd pick one up and this looks kind of interesting. And then start talking about that for a while. And then, oh, well, oh, well, let's talk about this one for now. You know, so it was, um, um, you know, it, it was a way of, of both being in the moment. Right. Yeah, with the content and with the audience, with the, 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 the student. And at the same time, um, being able to be reactive and responsive to that moment. Yeah. And so the extent to which we can break down sort of this, um, the rigidity of most course content. Right. Where you're sort of, part of it's the tool forces you to go from A to Z. Um, but part of it is just sort of the mindset of this is how you teach is to go from A to Z. Right. But, but by putting the AI in the middle and letting the AI take on some of, you know, some mimic Marvin's parlor trick to some degree. Yeah. Take, it yeah. All, take a look at what sort of, you know, what can I use the point of departure to actually get the student to start thinking deeply about this thing that I, I think is important. Right. And okay. rather than always starting them the same place. It's different from, say, the, the this isn't about, um, oh, you know, Johnny is having trouble with his uh, uh, sevens table, so let's give him more, you know, m multiplication of, you know, sevens. Right. It's, about right. It's, it's, it's much more about Johnny's actually interested in learning how to solve this kind of problem. Yeah. Let's engage yeah. him in that so that he gets deeper into it and, and yeah. starts realizing. It's about increase, increasing the, the level of engagement. Yeah. But I could see how, well, I guess two things. I could see how some instructors would be terrified by this. I can see how some students would be terrified by this. Um, you know, there, there's an element of fear, I think, that runs throughout our educational systems on, on, on all sides, really. And then I guess the other point I'd bring up is, if the idea is to increase the levels of engagement, is AI necessarily the best way to do that? Are there not other, like, methodologies, like, say, through means of communication? Uh, that could, you know, increase the collaboration, such as we see in our, you know, free software communities. Um, what makes you go the route of, well, we need artificial intelligence to, to be able to sit between the student and the, and the instructor? I I'll, I'll, can't answer, but I'll just answer first really quickly, which is I, my, my answer is simply um, uh, scale. Okay. Well, I think part of it is that what we really want is Learning happens best when it's driven by the curiosity of the person doing the learning. Okay. Um, and given that you're doing that, um, one of the things that AI can provide is it can provide the um, structure or background when someone is doing what's interesting to them and they need to know something rather than, uh, I mean, they could go out and they could ask the hive mind, uh, other students taking the course, people have taken it before, mentors, whatever. But um, the response to that, you know, when, when you post a question on Stack Overflow, uh, you often don't get a response right away. Most right. often, if you're lucky, you'll get responses from two years ago that actually <laughs> answer the question. But if yes. it's a problem, you're not going to run into that. But if, in fact, in the, the universe of a particular course or area or whatever, you, you, that answer is in there, right. the fact that the student isn't locked on uh, taking advantage of their learning impulse or following through on their learning impulse means that they'll be more excited about what they're learning now, retain it better, and more able to move on to the next thing. And so it's uh, because in one way or another, all of our minds are organized somewhat differently. Um, in many ways, there isn't a one order fits all model for right. anybody going through content. I mean, there's certain things that you need to learn before you learn other things, but uh, that's very, uh, a relatively sparsely constrained graph. Okay. Um, we're really using AI in order to uh, improve the ability for learning to be a process of discovery for the student. Right. 
Okay. So there's I mean, a couple of comments in terms of sort of the, the some teachers aren't going to like this, some students aren't going right. to like this. Right. Well, you know, you know, first of all, life is a Gaussian distribution. Okay. So <laughs> right. <laughs> you're always going to have people al along the curve in different places. Right. But, um, you know, one of the, one of the observations, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about teachers first. Um, okay. I think I've mentioned this to you before or made this observation with you before. Um, yeah, I, I met a lot of teachers when we were doing one laptop per child. And I met teachers from all walks of life and all parts of the planet. Sure. And, um, you know, one thing that was was pretty universal um, uh, was that teachers can learn to. Teachers what? I'm, oh, teachers right. Yes. Learn to. Yeah, the best way to learn is to have to teach the course, right? I mean, and, uh, you know, and, and but, you know, the, it's a system and the structures that take that opportunity away from teachers. But I think teachers are actually pretty happy when they're learning. Sure. Learning can be a little bit scary. Learning can be challenging. Um, learning can be work, but it's fun. It's hard, the hard fun that, that Marvin talks about. Right. It's, um, and, and I think the teachers, like, you know, actually get pleasure out of learning um, when, when they're given the opportunity. Um, so that's, that's sort of half of it. You know, the other half of it is, you know, from the, from the student perspective, um, and actually, there's a third perspective, which I'm going to get to as well, which is assessment. Okay. It's also critically important to any learning system. Um, but, you know, from, from the student perspective, in some, some sense, what we're doing is we're turning everything into uh, an open book exam. Okay. So, yes. and so we're, not, we're not asking people. To, I, me I remember what my daughter, uh, when she was in medical school, um, you know, the, 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 there's one course you have to take called pharmacology. Right. And basically, the approach everybody takes of pharmacology is memorize. And that's the only way to get through pharmacology unless you're my daughter, because my daughter inherited from her father her la the laziness gene. <laughs> she lazy to memorize all this stuff. And so she decided, well, I'm just going to figure out how it works. And it actually, pharmacology has a, a method to it, if you actually so. Um, but... Um, that, that digression aside, um, the idea that we can spend our time not memorizing, but applying the knowledge, A, it's a lot more fun, and B, it's a lot more scary. Um, because now we're, we're expected not to regurgitate back facts, but we're actually expected to think about and know about why this matters and how do I use this, not what is it, but what's it for. And so engaging in, in that. So if we let the, the AI worry about what it is and also help you identify what it's for and where to apply it, then you're in the you're in into the, the useful part of the learning. So the AI is just sort of an, an accelerant to get you to the good stuff. Okay. Now, again, that puts some onus on you as a learner to actually uh, be you know, le less passive. Right. Engage. That, yeah, that's, yeah. that's intimidating and that's that's work. It means that it's a lot a lot harder to sort of you know you know be under the radar and, and, and yeah. duck into the actual responsibility of learning. Yeah. Um, I'm glad you brought that up because one of the one of the criticisms of I guess online learning in general is that it's great for the self-directed. Yeah. And that gets into all sorts of societal biases and prejudice and you know racism, misogyny, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and you know what I'm leading up to, like, how, how do you, how do you go from creating learning environments that the self-directed people who are already fine right, versus the people who need help, right? How do you bridge that gap? Yeah, no, I mean, in fact, I mean, this is one of the reasons why I, th I think that, um, you know, things like the flipped classroom is actually kind of not, 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 the, not the right solution. Right, from exactly, Yeah. In order to really effectively implement a flipped classroom, you need to have support at home. And most of the kids who don't have support at home are the ones that need support at school. Right. And you know, so it, it, it's just not, uh, it, it, it doesn't always work. So that's, right. that's, that's absolutely, um, you know, a, a huge challenge. And I think, again, that what, um, I don't see AI as the panacea. AI is not going to solve this problem. Right. What AI is going to do is it's going to help us utilize whatever resources, human resources we have to be more efficiently applied 
to result to, to working on this problem. Sure. So if the teacher is actually in the in the classroom, much more in the role of mentor than instructor. The teacher is providing a lot more value, sure. and it's a lot more actually. Again, it's a lot more fun for the teacher um, and the learner. Um, it's more challenging, but it's 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 so. I, I think that you know the you know if 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 this is you know, if we're talking about these online platforms, again, as instructional, get the information from here to there, um, yeah. in your ear, and then how much of it can you regurgitate back? Okay, you're done. Right. That's, um, that, that model is, is only going to ever work for a very small subset. Um, and I think that, the, the, you know, the criticisms, oh, only, you know, you know, 97, 93% or whatever it used to be, that statistic of people don't complete their MOOCs and things like that, um, um, you know, there, there's some validity there. But if, if we restructure it so that it's not about getting from A to Z, but it's about engaging in this material and, mass, you know, achieving some mastery. I mean, again, there's, um, you know, if you look at the, the, the literature around motivation, um, and there's, there's actually quite rich literature around motivation and um, the, uh, the idea that what, what you – are motivated by is some kind of carrot or stick. Right. Um, well, that doesn't even work for mules. <laughs> and what it, what, but what it does do is it sort of makes you not invest in actually um, learning. It makes you invest in keeping your head down so you don't get hit. Yeah. That's um, right. And you're never going to actually ask a challenging question because you'll get hit. Um, so you, you sort of get out of that habit. It's a habit of mind. That you establish and so we want to establish a different habit of mind and again the, the the literature suggests that um you know autonomy and um mastery and a sense of purpose are what drive real motivation yeah and so the extent that we we can take this tool this tool i think tremendous potential um on, you know the online learning and and restructure it so that it's a little bit more autonomous mm -hmm. Terms of how you approach it, right. um, that um, you, you really do have the ability to drill down and master something. Mm -hmm. That it's much more about applying the knowledge through the, the guidance of this mentor. Right. We're using the AI to, to provide a lot of, uh, of the autonomy. Right. We're um, using, you know, it's, it's sort of like the AI is at sort of like the lower level of, of this value chain and that we're moving the teacher or the instructor to the higher level of the value chain. Right. You're, it's, it's effectively the same, well, the same role that technology has traditionally uh, been applied for, which is take care of the stuff you don't want to do so you can focus on the things that are more viable and things that you actually enjoy doing. Another part of it is that one of Marvin's tricks was always to uh, uh, take a dichotomy and try to imagine it as a continuum. Hmm. Interesting. And there's this dichotomy between this idea that you've either got a textbook where everything is in a particular order and there's exercises and you finish the exercise, or you have Wikipedia on the other side where people just explore and they do these webs of knowledge. And there are things in between, but it's difficult to do the things in between without some kind of adaptive replacement for the ordering that does happen in a textbook and right. we're using AI in some sense to uh, fill in the continuum between uh, a regular sort of programmed course and a entirely free form self-driven exploratory course. And That's the idea in there is to essentially uh, address those folks you were talking about as well as everybody else by bringing people, um, giving people help when they need help and giving them freedom where the freedom is what uh, keeps them engaged and gives them sort of ownership of their own learning, hmm. which without which they're, they're, they're not gonna uh, keep learning for the rest of their lives, which is what we want. That's, that's great. We, you know, um, I think you guys have a lot to offer. I'm, I'm glad we had the chance to sit down. Uh, any, uh, any parting shots, anything that, that you think people should know before we, uh, 
Well, I, mean, I, I, I did. I did want to touch just briefly on assessment. Yeah. I, oh, that's right. That was the third thing that you, uh, um, you mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I think that for any number of reasons, assessment's important. It's certainly important um, to administer learning. And, you know, we need to, um, you know, have these certificates and we need to sort of, you know, there are right, right. lots of mundane but pragmatic reasons why we need to do all that stuff. Okay? Right. It's not, it's not simply to, you know, ensure that the funding for education continues. Um, but, but the other thing is that we also want to think about um, um, what does the learner know about what they've learned? And to, to, so there, my, my favorite approach to, to assessment is portfolio. Mm. And because with a, with a portfolio, you really have a record of, of not, not what do I know, but what can I do? Look, I did that. And six months ago, this is what I was doing. And so the idea that um, we can, you know, we can still have sort of the traditional assessment, but really focusing much more on, on portfolio. And I think that the nice thing, one of the nice things about these online courses, and I, I don't think that they're doing as much as they could in this space, is that right. it is online, okay? It, it, and so we can actually start to n not just record whether or not the, the student got the right answer when they did the multiple choice at the end of the chapter, but we can also start to capture a little bit of, about what they've done and build a digital portfolio for them, I think is, is an unexploited, I mean, there's some people that are doing some great work in that space, but mm -hmm. sorry. Um, and, and we need to do more of that. I don't know yet. I haven't thought about it enough. Maybe by the time of the conference, I'll have some better insight into this. But I really think that there's, there's a role for the AI in that space. Because if the AI can start to look at your portfolio and start right. to help you understand what it is you've learned and help to, again, this whole idea, I know it was, it was the hot topic at last year's conference, uh, again, nobody. I don't think anybody had any good ideas yet, but we, we all knew that it was an, the important thing to look at is how do we suggest to the learner what's next? And well, that's, a, that's the perfect teaser for your keynote then. So we'll <laughs> look forward to see uh, what you find out between now and then. That would be uh, always keep wanting more, right? So. Yeah. All right. All right. Great. So, uh, all right, so I'll try to think about that between now and then. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, reminder, uh, Walter Bender will be keynoting at the uh, Open edX conference March 26th to 29th uh, at UC San Diego. We're looking forward to that. Thank you so much, uh, Walter and Ken, for, uh, uh, for being with us today.